cover these slides. Okay, we have touched upon this. Okay, this is where we are. Um, high level, we are going to touch on pretty much the entire kind of ISACA part, as well as the NIST part. This is just high level review. Do not expect us to dive in as much. If you need a dive in, refer to your textbook or kind of um, your uh, the class videos. And if there is not enough information over there, please again, feel free to reach out to me. Lately, I will emphasize on you reaching out to me more than you reach out to Dave. It's end of the semester for him. He is underwater as well as a lot of people are. Uh, so uh, on my part, I'm free. So let me know. Okay, um, high level, pretty much a lot of you are aware of this, but we've been talking around roles, right? Within an organization, we believe, I believe we have spoken a lot and given emphasis to senior management, they drive things, we spoke about mid-management and anybody be below the mid-management level, uh, that's where like standards, baselines and things like that are getting implemented. We spoke about baselines, procedures, guidelines, uh, we touch upon the roles of committees and uh, like the audit and whatsoever. I believe we even showed this image yesterday. Now I'm going fast because I would like to go into the content, but we've been talking so much around one thing, around when it comes to not necessarily decision, but having a buy-in and having an organizational culture that focuses on security and all of those things, we want a top-down approach to most things. Not when it comes to just decision, but also um, having a good risk management framework. I'll be honest, um, if I'm a risk professional and I know an organization has a, doesn't have a, uh, like the senior management within an organization do not necessarily care about security. I am absolutely not gonna go there for myself. Like, no, absolutely not. So um, top-down approach, always, always a great idea, always a uh, great methodology when it comes to having um, a healthy security uh, mindful organization, right? Again, we spoke about top-down, eh, not really. It's basically a tough challenge for people when it comes to, um, when you find like the lower level or rather the junior staffs are the ones who are trying to influence change. We are all on the same page on that. Okay, um, we kind of know that. I'm trying to skip all of these because honestly, uh, please don't take the equal sign there. I remember the last class I was in, um, one of my students was emphasizing like, hey, you said create save is equal to security, which is equal. That is absolutely not equal. Equality means one-to-one. -one. This is a match. I'm like, hold on, this is not a match class. This is just not a match class. So don't take it as one-to-one. -one. But basically we spoke about how our uh, creating a safe uh, kind of environment or even designing a safe technology environment also is synonymous with implementing security, right? Because you implement security, create safety, which also means risk management. We spoke about how it is very important to see governance from an adding value perspective, not necessarily always from that protection, 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 or defense, defense, defense. Now, it doesn't mean that security doesn't translate to defense or doesn't translate to protection. It just means that it is, people tend to associate those words with kind of a negative notations. So truthfully, our ability to see the other side of the spectrum where we are able to see how implementing security and having uh, risk management uh, methodologies, frameworks, deploying them within organizations and injecting everything into that governance is more of an adding value thing, not necessarily just focus on the defense, allow us to be able to communicate with the senior management, the leadership, where they have been pretty much conditioned and wired to only respond to things that is impactful or adding value, whatever that value means, be it profit, be it whatever the organization made, uh, mission is, right? 
All right, um, spoke about IT governance and risk management, and we spoke about different compliance uh, um, frameworks, like we kind of touch upon ISACA and the NIST RMF, which all of them today we are going to go into the review. Okay, can anyone remind me? Actually not remind me, I already know, but what was the first chapter we covered in the ISACA book? What do we do first within that ISACA method of risk management? Identify. What do we identify? We identify risks. Correct. So here we have the IT risk identification, right? And we spoke about a lot of things, which we are now going to dive, in, dive into them high level. Now, the way I'm presenting this is perfectly aligned with the book. Yes, I used the board perfectly. I am perfect. Am I not? I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Um, but yeah, I kind of just took the book's chapters to uh, take them on that like uh, alignment, right? The review and the book um, and the book chapters. So we have 1.1, which was more around that risk capacity, the risk appetite, risk tolerance. We also have that risk um, 1.2 around risk culture and communication. What does this mean? Anybody, just please keep it short, five seconds, 10 seconds. When we talk about that risk up, risk capacity, appetite and tolerance, please, please, please keep it short. It's a long class. So um, what exactly are we talking about? Feel free to use the chat if you want, because uh, let me actually see the charts. Feel free to see the chat if you rather do that or if you want, just unmute yourself, five seconds. What? What are we talking about around risk capacity, appetite, and tolerance? What does that mean? Anybody? Capacity is how much uh, loss can the firm or enterprise absorb and still stay in business? Okay. Appetite and tolerance. How does that differ with tolerance? Uh, the appetite is is how much the management of the firm is willing to accept okay and and it should always be less than the capacity and then the tolerance is is the uh the amount of variance from uh the appetite that they're willing to accept so how does that differ with your definition of capacity well appetite plus tolerance has to be less than the capacity because the capacity if if you exceed the capacity you're you're basically going to go out of business because you you've got a loss that you can't recover from got it so like tolerance is most synonymous with threshold absolutely i agree so perfectly put together or i wasn't sure who was it i know that voice john holbert oh john hey so yeah correct um we spoke about that risk culture and communication Anybody, quick thing, high level? Who drives risk culture and communication within an organization? Senior management. Senior most management. Correct, so who, how? How does senior management ensure a, they create a great- um, By active communication. Okay, that's one. Top down okay. approach. Okay, top-down approach, absolutely. But top-down approach is more so like if senior management are open to um, uh, creating a great uh, risk culture within the environment, then you find like that's the method, right? But um, how can senior management really ensure those things, right? We touched upon a couple of them. Uh, one of them was the communication that was just said, right? But staying on top of that risk compliance, um, how do they deal with negative outcomes, right? We spoke about situations where if um, an organization has a more of an attitude of responding or penalizing employees based on negative uh, consequences or maybe mistakes rather than being open to it to from a corrective path, you find that employees will actually decide not to report um, issues, right? We spoke about that. Uh, also the communication, right? So the first one is more towards that behavior, right? Towards the compliance, whether if the organization is willing to, just an example, someone was telling me 
right now a lot of organizations have actually started using the NIST 800-53 but DRA 5 which just came out so you can tell like that's an organization like it's willing to be on top of things I assure you others will have to wait till it's like one week <laughs> or a month before GAO comes into the picture and start looking at which version are you looking uh, do you have in place that's when you start scrambling things together right um, that's all towards that behavior Someone also mentioned the communication. How is the uh, organization respond, like providing updates, right? The organization's capability and uh, is it communicated to the uh, employees around what the organization can actually take around that capacity, the organizational risk thresholds and things like that, and certain clear expectations, touch upon that. So what are some elements of risk that we spoke about? We touch about elements of risk. And please don't open your book on this. It's meant to be collaborative and use it as an avenue for you to test your knowledge of the class. And you should be able to identify where you have gaps. So don't open your book. But what are the elements of risk? We, meant, we spoke a lot on these parts around things that must be in place for but, risk to happen. Uh, there are like uh, tangible risks and intangible, you mm. know, when it comes to like risk of, uh, you know, like the business reputation, uh, when it comes to tangible, the revenue risks, you know. So I see those more as things that can, that, uh, yeah, but not necessarily elements. I guess by elements of risk, I'm looking at what needs to be in place for a risk, for something to be a risk. Threat. Okay. Multiplied by uh, the frequency. Okay, frequency Wait, equals a uh, probability. That's got to be in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Likelihood. Oh, yeah, that's likelihood. likelihood. That's 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 vulnerability. I remember like, one of the questions we spoke about this, right? Yeah. So what are they? Likelihood. Okay, likelihood, that's one. And what? Vulnerability. Vulnerability and what? Impact. Okay. Correct. Now, there is one thing, though, which is hardly talked about but you actually cannot even have a risk without it completely or even you will not even have a vulnerability without it what's that a threat i'm sorry a threat uh so threat and uh that's correct but i was actually looking more for an asset right <laughs> if there's no asset then pretty much there's nothing of value but yes, you all are correct around that. The likelihood, impact, vulnerabilities, assets, and all of that are the risk factors, right? Spoke about that. What are the information security risk concepts and principles, which is basic, everybody knows them, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, including the non-repediation. Um, we also spoke about IT risk strategies of the business, right? These are around the major generic things around getting senior management support. Uh, this is the, the second item here is one that we keep echoing in the class. Do things that align with the business goals and objectives, uh, the mission of the organization, all of those things. Don't do things just because you think that is the right way of doing it. Don't do it because you think, yeah, it's good for us to have this security mechanism in place. Nope. Security is not meant to be maximized. Security is meant to complement the organization's mission, goals, and objectives, and all of those things, right? So there is no value in you doing things that do not help the broader business. It doesn't matter where you are sitting within the organization. The goal is to support the business, right? Um, organizational structures, we spoke about that around that race, who is responsible, who is accountable. Uh, we didn't touch much on consulted and informed, but informed are kind of pretty much everybody that is part of that organization that is privy to do certain information. Uh, consulted could be the risk managers that are usually coming to the picture. Uh, fortune, I'm gonna call him out. I know he's a consultant. Uh, <laughs> laws, regulations, standards, compliance, all of these are all mixed in a single bowl, right? That they tend to help us define those strategies we are going to take. If it's an, uh, if one is playing within an industry that has been truly fleshed out and there are clear regulations in place, you find it easy to know the strategy you're going to take. If you are, if 
there is none you're playing in uncharted territory then now you are the organization is taking the burden of how should we handle things what is the ethical way of doing things what will be the right thing that also supports the business an example um the us still do not have a data privacy or data regulation law at the national level so you find from a national standpoint truthfully every organization is just trying to do the right thing but there's no law requiring them to do certain thing certain aspect around data um state levels california just released theirs other states also do have it um when it also now comes to same thing data actually or like the EU entirely where they have GDPR. Again, why is the US still not pushing for that data regulation? There are a lot of lobbies that are actually paying money for that not to happen. I kid you not. Because guess what? The arts industry in itself, you getting those mails in your mailbox will be heavily impacted because if the data regulation at the national level is done in the right manner or at least good enough then it will provide the consumer with the option of saying this person should not sell my information whatsoever right go look at the ad industry and see how many <laughs> the net worth of that industry i think it's in billions does some does anybody know anyone know like the size of the ads industries on those companies? it's going to be billions exactly so yeah if you if you lock down people's privacy with regard to what you can and can't send to them yeah you have no ad industry if you have no ad industry you have no pharmaceutical companies pumping stuff <laughs> anyway yeah i mean you can see where this goes right <laughs> no exactly like um the more you keep following it the more truthfully yeah it's a lot um you close on a mortgage and you instantly finished filing the papers but before you realize it everybody knows like you just closed right and <laughs> that thing keeps piling up in your mailbox like hey you got this you got this so all of those things yep um you move an address and it's kind of so unfortunate but even usps you just don't know how the heck does usps give it to those third parties um move to a new place and ikea begins sending you a kid like like hey here's a good tv stand <laughs> so it's a whole industry on its own data privacy laws will absolutely give empower the consumer to make the decision if, if those things should happen or not on the other side even though there is none in the us you find our certain um like the major providers and the big corporations are trying to do the right thing of like okay maybe if you don't want it disable it it's going to be there by default but if you don't want it go disable it the the silly one that i that tend to piss me off is when you unsubscribe from like something within an email and they send you another email telling you that you have unsubscribed <laughs> unsubscribed right all right uh moving on establishing an approach to risk management um again this is heavy in terms of if laws exist you find like the approach for risk management is kind of clear cut um if laws do not exist but there is a clear um regulation in place then you still find like the approach is easier to follow but if there is none we only have standards in place that uh everybody can meet then you find the organization is not being tasked with the burden of what should the approach be an example of this will be look at nest nest is actually in as much as the ato is chaotic it is only chaotic in the sense of implementation but not necessarily what the deliverable or process should be it's been clear from the 800-37 document um from nest around follow the steps right from sub zero to categorize select everything we did in the class wherever you go is the same thing be it um any agency what they decide on to implement and what level of control should be is where the difference starts to come into the picture but the approach is really matured across the industry especially within the gov now when you take something like pci dss which is not necessarily a law but it's a regulation that has been matured and every card vendor or card provider like visa mastercard or so on must comply with it it's kind of clear how it should be followed right but still approach to meeting that differs then um data regulation as we mentioned truthfully at the national level us 
it's not, there's no law or regulation in place at the national level. So you find the approach towards securing your data other than like say HIPAA within the health and other things, um, it's not really clear. Every organization can come with things on how they decide whether to do that or not. I mean, it's silly how if you're a WhatsApp user, you cannot disable showing that you're online or if you are chatting on Facebook, you can show that you are offline or not, something like that, right? Again, that's Facebook approach of, we are not going to empower users to be able to do this. And they are absolutely within, they are right to say that because there is no regulation in place that allow uh, us for that. I don't think there's any data regulation or privacy regulation that is as matured that covered like you being uh, showing whether you're online or offline and like messaging apps and things like that. I can tell you eventually we might get there, but we're not. All right, um, moving on. Oh, we have spoke about also as a risk professional, whether you have an IT background or not, if you are looking at risk from an IT perspective, some key areas of concerns to always pay attention to is the hardware, software, operating system. Well, operating system is also under software. The entire environment. But another thing that is missed in this deck is lately it started getting bundled into IT risk as well, which is supply chain, right? It never used to, but it has started becoming an IT related thing. Um, as such, it's very good for all risk professionals that focus on IT risk to really also ramp up on what kind of risk uh, present themselves or rather what kind of risk exists within the supply chain. Um, the DOD is actually making it a big deal around CMMC. If you don't know what that is, just look it up. Um, it's not part of the class, but it's a nice to know. Not must know. Um, what next? Uh, uh, someone has a question. It seems like someone was going off mute. Okay. Um, we spoke about how do you identify risk? Okay, now that we are talking about all of these places to pay attention to what are the elements and everything, Open flow. What? How do you identify it? Please keep it short. What should you do to identify your risk? Anybody? Can you identify? So, what are the elements of risk? You can see them up there. You need to identify your assets. Okay, that's one. Absolutely agree with you on that. Is that the only thing you need to do to identify the risk? No. <laughs> Can I get a little bit more than no? <laughs> That's funny. Anyone? You have to identify absolutely, but then what next? What do you do next? You have to identify the vulnerabilities of the assets, the threats okay. to the assets. Okay. And once you have a vulnerability, now you have a risk, or you have to do more? The likelihood of it happening. Okay. So what the impact would be to the asset. Okay. Uh, any other thing? Yeah, that's it. I've heard you identify your asset, you look into the vulnerabilities that uh, exist within the asset and you see the likelihood, right? Any other thing? Um, this is Sam. Um, this is my approach to um, risk identification, identifying your asset identifying the weaknesses or the vulnerabilities of the asset. Okay. Then you um, fish out for the threats that can exploit those vulnerabilities. And okay. That next uh, turn in the other way around, identify threats first before vulnerabilities. But I don't go up by that. So identify asset, identify the vulnerabilities, and then identify threats that can exploit those vulnerabilities. And, okay. then, and then we can find the likelihood that those threats will really exploit the vulnerabilities and if it will exploit the impact it will. Correct. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I agree with you both, you, um, especially around the identified asset, the vulnerabilities, just like, it was it Stephanie? She also said the same thing. Um, so yeah, you both are correct. Um, uh, one more thing, there's one nuance there that we said. 
around risk. This is not necessarily a risk identification thing, but it is always good for risk professionals to do when identifying risk, because when it comes to responding to the risk, it allows them to know where to start. What is that thing? Maybe the business objective? I mean, that's pretty much if you are breathing within the risk management framework, you should also breathe in alignment with the business objective. <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, I mean, um, I was looking more from like existing controls. So now that you have identified all of those things, what controls already exist because it allows you to know what you need to do to cover the rest, right? But yep, everything's correct. Um, we spoke about risk scenarios in the interest of time. I'm just gonna actually know what on what like what do you need to have in place to be able to get us to create a successful risk scenario? Uh, doctor, I think this when uh, you take two approaches, top down, then the reverse, um, down to top, so you can cover. Uh, all aspects or majority of aspects to give you a better idea of the risk scenarios? So that would be more your approach to responding to the risk in terms of like, but the risk scenarios is to create a case or something, right? So I agree with you around your response approach and whatsoever you should get input from the top down and everything. And even when creating the risk scenarios, the people that should be involved should all uh, be that, but I'm looking at if you are to create a risk scenario, what are you like? First, what does a risk scenario mean? I guess maybe that will help answer the question. So, risk scenario is like looking for the factors that could affect on your business, you know, and how these risks can um, be realistic, you know, to be realized. It's like look at the factors and everything that is exactly risk identification. Because if you're looking at those and how they affect you, that is risk identification. Anything you look into and to see how it affects your organization, that will be more of you have identified a risk. But create like risk scenario is pretty much if you have identified like a tsunami is gonna happen, then you sit down and now say like, okay, tsunami is happening, what do we do? Does that make sense? Correct. So it's like going back to the elements of risk, like you're measuring the likelihood by the impact to, yep. to generate the risk scenario. All of those things, I agree. And we discuss them in the risk edit. I guess I'm looking for if you are going to create a risk, like a risk scenario, you are like if, let's switch to firefighters. If firefighters are having a fire drill, they basically just go through the entire sequence of operation they do when there is a real fire, right? They do it to make sure that they are still able to efficiently respond to a real life scenario, right? That's why they create a risk scenario, which is one is a fire drill. We all hate it at work. You hear the alarm before, they even give you a heads up like, hey, it's a false one, but you hear the alarm. Sometimes they even do the blinded scenarios where you hear the alarm and they literally want everybody to see, like they want everyone to go out of the building to make sure that, yes, people will be in compliance with those kind of things if it were to happen, right? So those are all part of creating a risk, like creating risk scenarios. But I guess what I was looking for is you cannot have a risk scenario in place without people taking different roles. Like we cannot do it without identifying what the threat is, who should be the actor and the time, the asset, the resources. In the case of like a firefighter and fire drills, you have to also factor in like, maybe you don't want people to take the elevator, you want them to take the stairs, how many floors is it, how, what the time and all of those, how many people would you want as resources, what are the events and all of those kind of things, right? Um, do you want to lock the entire elevator or do you still want to leave it operational and see if people will actually, yes, it's a fire drill, but if they will still go ahead and take the elevator instead of taking the stairs as recommended, right? So all of those things, I see them as now the outcome of the risk scenarios. Um, moving on, we spoke, up, we have always said things around ownership. We have to clearly define who 
owns, who is responsible, and who is accountable. And we have a risk register. I saw um, Alicia added a risk register into that. Everything must go into the risk register, right? Once you have identified a risk, it must go in there. It must have an ID, a unique ID, a description, and then it must have an ownership, right? Um, the risk scenarios is not necessarily it's not a must, it depends on which approach you're taking. Like ATO wise, we don't really put risk scenarios into the risk register. Hardly would you see like a risk scenario in um, a program, but you can have a document that documents, uh, like you can have a document containing what the tabletop exercise was, or even just have a, I had like, <laughs> the other day a friend was telling me that he, they just had their tabletop exercise via Zoom. It's kind of funny the times we live in, but yeah, that's a tabletop exercise, right? Where everybody's working through their own responsibility if something were to happen. Um, Professor, I have a question on this one. Yeah. Um, can there be more than one risk scenario associated with a particular risk ID, which I assume maps to a specific risk. In other words, when I think about this, I think there could be multiple scenarios, but maybe maybe not the way this is being defined. I don't know. So the risk ID you are seeing on the risk register should not be for the risk. The ID should not be for the risk scenario, but it should be for the risk itself. Right. Everything should be uniquely identified. But could you have say three or five different risk scenarios that are associated with a particular risk? Yeah, it's possible okay. where you can consist of risk scenarios. There is no one prescriptive way because at the, again, keep in mind, it's a scenario. So you are basically making an education. This way to happen. How would we respond to it? And I've seen risk scenarios created in multiple occasions, honestly. Like you can find your, let me give you a quick example. You can say like, oh, we are having a risk scenarios today because we feel, I, we think we are actually vulnerable to a, a DDoS attack, right? Okay, great. Now that you have done that and there is a risk of DDoS attack, you have said like, hey, all our systems are down or whatsoever. Then it evolves into another risk scenario because actually, let me give you a, a real life scenario that happened. Uh, I can't remember the name of the ransomware attack that happened, but it affected the UK health uh, systems and pretty much all the computers were unusable, right? And they weren't prepared, even though it's partially their fault. They were also using like an end of life Windows systems, I think XP, something like that. And this happened like last year. Some of you should remember the name of the ransomware. I can't remember what's the name. Uh, not the yeah, wanna cry basically. Um, it happened. Some of the systems were down. They were implant. Uh, they really didn't plan for this. Now let's assume it's not real life. It's more of a scenario. It instantly evolved into another risk because patients that are from like that literally are connected to certain systems and whatsoever started having issues. Um, medications that the prescriptions were stored in those computers that were hijacked. A lot of nurses do not know what the prescription or medication should be for some uh, patient who actually <laughs> might not even remember what their prescription is, right? So all of those things, you can see how from a DDoS attack, it does not present an additional risk. So yes, a single risk can actually have multiple scenarios because it's a sequence. Great question, by the way. Um, any question on this? Okay. Next, um, we have identified the risk. We are gonna go into risk assessment, right? We spoke about the different risk assessment techniques. We have spoke about- um, I'm sorry, this is Stephanie. Could you go back to the other one quickly? The last okay. page. Mm -hmm. If you're taking a screenshot, I believe we have these slides on canvas, don't we? No, we don't have them on canvas. Oh, we don't? Then I absolutely usually provide these slides. So uh, I will upload them. And if you don't see them, just shoot me an email. Oh, so you'll, you'll shoot the email with them? No, no, no. I, I said like, I will upload these to canvas. Okay, thank you. 
And if you don't see them on canvas, just send me an email and I will do it. Mm. Yeah, I feel a bit, a bit exposed because Dave is the one who is on top of things and I'm the slacker. So he makes me look good. Now I feel like because he's slammed with his exams, I'm also going to... Ah, I'm going to it's last lecture, so it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that bad is not good enough for me. Please, no worries. You're a great doctor. It's all good. No, but uh, we will upload this, absolutely. All right, um, we spoke about different risk assessment techniques. Um, if you can remember in the slide, we showed a lot. And even beyond that, which actually got us into a conversation that uh, today we might actually have a good nice presentation around different techniques and methodologies, right? Um, towards the end of the class. But yeah, which one does NIST, which approach does NIST take out of these four that we listed? The US government, which approach do they take when it comes to risk assessment techniques? Business impact analysis? Yep. NIST is based on uh, BIA. How do you analyze risk scenarios? We basically touched upon it earlier, right? I know of that. Um, current state of controls. So we discussed around, this is actually a good thing we should go back to. Implementing a control does not translate to responding to a risk because you have to know the effectiveness of the control, right? So the current state of control, always uh, good to actually assess those as well, because there is misconfigured controls, lack of monitoring, outdated controls, all of those things. We also spoke about like the different categories of controls around like the preventive deterrent and all of those uh, nice ones. What's an example of a preventive control? Anyone? Firewall. Firewall as a preventive control. Okay. Any example of a detective control? Monitoring. Monitoring is not a control. What's monitoring? Monitoring is a process. <laughs> I'm sorry, well. Snort operating in intrusion detection mode. Uh, snort uh, operating in, did you say intrusion prevention? In intrusion detection mode. In other words, not not yeah. operating in prevention. I thought you were talking about the IPS, not IDS. I would have said, like, you literally just said IPS, like preventive mechanism. Yeah, I'll give it to you. The idea. Uh, this one is a good one, Cleonia. Detection, like the camera. The, What's that? The, the, the camera, the detection camera. Could, yeah. Could detect any trigger mm -hmm. to the watching officer. So when it triggers to the watson officer, what does it do? What does he do? Yeah. It could be a preventive control if he really want to move. Okay, it seems an application, no additional accent, that's fine. I will take that. What's an example of a company? Actually, before we get that, Cleandra, what's that? You said that's a good one. I was trying to see, did I miss a joke or is it another? Oh, no, um, I was I was referring to uh, what, um, I forget, I apologize, but the previous person you said about snort. Because oh, yeah. I've definitely seen that a couple of times happen. Well, snort is, a, is a, I think they have a paid version, but it's a good open source um, ideas. By the way, if someone wants to have a good hands-on, like, uh, continuous monitoring and all of these technical tools. Just go, the, instead of looking at the single tools, um, look into Security Onion, the Linux distro, Security Onions. It comes up with a lot of these tools pre-installed in it. Also, I think Kali Linux also. Um, um, also, peer, does also peer security. Yep. Yeah, that's I, yeah, I play with that a lot. Yeah, that's correct. All right, um, any example of a compensating control before we move forward? None? Policy? Uh, policy is, uh, is too vague. What kind of policy are we talking about? Uh, acceptable use policy for a network. Acceptable use policy for a network. How does it compensate? What does it necessarily compensate? It sounds more like a directive control for me. What about COOP? 
Coop, what's Coop? Continuity of operations. Continuity of operation. Those are all processes, not the controls themselves. Like when you see, like when we set a firewall, someone said, like when we said preventive, someone said a firewall, that's a control. When we ask detective and someone said smart IDS, that system well, multi, multi factor authentication. Yep. I will accept the multi-factor authenticator as a consolidating control because we have the username and password and now the additional thing is to come from it. I agree with that, I will take that. But keep in mind there are also instances where it could be the preventive control. But yes, I will take uh, MFA as the component. Oh, uh, how do we measure controls? We have audits, uh, business continuity plan, Recovery plan. I once had a question of please can everybody go on this. I once had a question of how does uh BCP and DRP allows you major control? So before I answer that, I know I asked the question. Does any can anyone tell me how will a business continuity plan or a disaster recovery plan allow you major controls? Anyone? What's the last word, doctor? Allow you what? I'm sorry. DRP and BCP. BCP is business continuity plan. Uh -huh. and DRP is disaster recovery plan. How will they allow you major controls? Because we have them there as control measurement. And we said BCP and DRP. How do you use that? Would that be after a disaster occurred though, that you um, can measure it? Because can you measure it prior to that? Mm -hmm. you, should, you should. Or like tabletop exercises. Correct. Absolutely. Like those scenarios and whatsoever will allow you because <coughs> who said that, by the way? It was Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, I was about to say <laughs> this one, but no, it's you or not. You have been in the game for ages. So, <laughs> so you don't get that uh, whatsoever. But yes, uh, absolutely. Um, whenever you do a risk scenario, like you do a tabletop exercise or whatsoever, like even the firefighters doing a fire drill, basically they are measuring controls. Like they are measuring to see what we have put in place, be it a guideline process, technical implementation, whatsoever. Even if it's just a directive control that has told everybody like, please, whenever there's a fire drill, do not take the elevator, take the stairs. But then, you know, in every situation, there are people like me who just don't listen. Like, you know, uh, so I ended up taking the elevator. What does that tell the firefighters? That that is ineffective because there is one person who is not following it. As such, we have to find a way to make sure that that control is being implemented. So should they shut, should, like, should there be some sort of a trigger that automatically when the fire alarm starts, then all elevators should be shut down? I don't know, but it clearly tells them that the control they have put in place, which is those policy and those little fancy notes that are usually put next to the exit sign in the doors, that there are people like me who just don't care to read it. So as such, I'm taking the elevator when the fire drop. That is a clear control management, uh, control management approach. Does that kind of clarify? Anyone? I like it. Yeah. So now you got me wondering what the uh, mm -hmm. elevators do. Do they go to the floor? Uh, do they go to the ground floor? What? Do they... I don't know. I will anticipate. I think in my viewpoint, but well, I'm not a firefighter, but so I cannot even see the additional th risk that might be presented. But I would say let the elevators automatically be shut down once the fire alarm starts. That way the control is not a direct. I'll be honest with you, directive controls, unless it is the law, and even if it is the law, it is usually enforced, people uh, are a bit too lax about it. How many of us will go into our organization or maybe our organization have a policy of, hey, do not use office work for your personal use, but I mean, I'll still open my Gmail. If they don't want me to do that, then they should block it, right? 
So directives are really not that enforced. But yeah, I mean, um, I don't know how they handle elevator generator. <laughs> I really don't. But yeah, uh, BCPs and DRP can be used as a control measurement thing. Now, um, from a risk management angle, I actually will spend some time on this. This is seeing the other side of it, right? Truthfully, earlier we mentioned about like having risk scenarios, tabletop and whatever, and like from a compliance to see if people will do it, but now I'm seeing it from your perspective of a risk management, a risk professional or being the firefighter, what do you get out of it? That's what you get out of it. Your ability to measure the effectiveness of your control, right? All right, um, incident response, vulnerability assessment, uh, all of those I believe everybody's kind of under, understand vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, and things like that, right? Okay, um, what next? Changes in risk environment, we mentioned this, we even gave two examples. As a risk professional, you always have to make sure you are aware of things. I just don't want to say <laughs> the, what I wanted to say because if I say it, it gives the answer. So I will go with things. But you also, we always kind of want to know. Hmm. You know what? I'll just ask a question. What are things you should be paying attention to when it comes to changes in um, environment risk or the risk that exists within your environment? Well, I can give one good example, which affects pretty much every enterprise and government every okay. month, which is newly discovered vulnerabilities in software that everybody uses. So you have the so-called monthly uh, re remediation or patch cycle that has to be evaluated and considered and acted upon. I agree with that around zero day vulnerabil vulnerabilities and whatsoever, right? And we also, that's from the technical perspective. Anybody want to give me like from the business angle? What kind of risk presents themselves? We mentioned it, we presented two. One from a technical angle and one from a, uh, from that non-technical but just generic business, which lately has been really going up. Industry trends. Remote work? Yeah, that's part of in industry trend. Absolutely, like remote work is an example of industry trends, right? Um, uh, if <laughs> imagine an organization now saying like, yeah, we're not going to support remote work, assuming it's not like an essential work similar to analysis and things like that, but like any organization that is more IT focused or kind of just that nine to five sitting at work behind a computer related stuff and them saying like, yeah, we're not going to someone support um, remote work. Trust me, they're gonna lose a lot of people because not everybody will be comfortable going to work in this day and age uh, with COVID and all, right? So industry trends. If Marimon were not open to having remote classes, guess what happens? None of you will be here, simple. Like, you know, is it worth it? They don't even provide, it's 2020 and they don't allow you to go to class remotely? Absolutely not. So yeah, um, industry trends. Emerging technology, similar to um, the point- Migration we, to the cloud? Yeah, there will be more around uh, emerging tech, right? It could also fall on our industry trends, but uh, emerging technologies, right? Which cloud is an emerging thing. So absolutely, especially for us within the IT side, we can continuously look at the tech, but it's also important to understand the industry and where it is moving, right? And this is why in this class, everyone is doing news report that is no older than two weeks. Because how would you know the emerging technologies and industry trends? Information, that's the one source because you don't have it in your organization. Uh, I can tell you another thing in the industry trend that is really ramping up super, super quick. And it's happening more with the younger folks. Um, 
yeah, because I'm in the generation, I like to call it up, like millennials and the Gen Zs. If you are not going to support a flexible work schedule that allow people to really just provide you with deliverables when it is done uh, by meeting like a deadline, not necessarily just like if you are going to micromanage, good luck continuing with that in, with that culture within an organization in the next five to 10 years. You will turn around and find that, that you don't have anybody because yeah, this new way of work, truly the new employees are valuing their flexibility more than they are looking into commitment within the organizations, right? I think a recent poll, when was it? No, it's actually, I was internally around, was it Microsoft? Or was it when I was at Deloitte? I can't remember, but there was a poll and literally people were asking for um, higher vacation days than salary. So this is an industry trend. And if you don't pay attention to it, not necessarily implement it. If you don't pay attention to it, you can lose stuff. <laughs> Let me give you a quick example. Even the, the US Gov is looking at how can we truly, truly ensure that classified work is being done from work? Imagine outside of skip, like this is a new thing, right? So how can we ensure like classified work is being done? Why? Because the, we found ourselves in a new situation, truthfully. Remote work is now taking over. It's the new thing. And I can tell you as things evolve, there are people that will actually decide not to get a clearance only because it requires them to go into a skiff with no wristwatch or any digital device, right? And I can begin to see that. It's absolutely gonna happen. So the industry needs to evolve. All right, um, next program manage, uh, project and program management. We touched I got on- a question, Dr. Ibrahim, please. Right. Uh, <laughs> speaking of the changes in the risk environment, do these changes affect the risk register? Do these changes affect the risk register? Oh, so it depends, right? Absolutely. If your organization is, <laughs> I don't think there are organizations. Actually, there is. Um, I was about to say there are no organization, but there is. There are organizations that actually monitor trends. Like Gartner does that a lot. Deloitte does that a lot. A lot of these big techs actually monitor trends. Now, I don't know if they have a place that they are tracking which trends are going up and down. And it also depends on the trend itself. But in this situation, you can find like, say from Gartner um, databases and repositories, you can actually go in there if you have a subscription and look at what are the emerging texts and what is the forecast for next year. And each single one has a unique identifier. So I was that in that situation, then it becomes a risk register. Uh, but not necessarily to Gartner, but rather because Gartner is doing that to sell, right? So I guess there, there is still documentation, basically. All right. Um, Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, man. Look into Gartner. I think other than Gartner, there is, is it Forrest or what's that name? I can't remember, but basically they invest a lot into doing those type of research. Big force do that a lot as well. Also, international organizations like UN, World Bank, they all do those kind of things. All right, um, what next? Yeah, we spoke about uh, scope creeps, right? Um, around just IT projects, very common. Um, lack of skill resources, lack of skill staff, lack of budget. Uh, scope creep is a common one, uh, especially in consulting. Anyone with <laughs> that knows consulting knows around if you don't thoroughly go through an RFP or when you're writing your proposal, you might miss something and truly the client can decide like, yeah, this is part of that initial proposal. So before you realize it, then you cannot even see where the profit is, right? Um, project management, we mentioned things around lack of project management can result in pretty much the entire loss of business, inefficient process because uh, project management, lack of, um, Great project management is ultimately means there is no good project management hand, uh, process, right? And when you don't have a process, when it comes to running organizations and implementing 
sorry, I'm responding to risk and all of these risk management stuff. If you don't have a process, then you find like you are basically jumping all around, like how do we do this? How do we do this? And then it becomes very inefficient, right? So we also mentioned um, on the systems and technology side, things around SDLC, that's the either system or software development lifecycle. We mentioned the different phases that uh, we go through. All right, next um, around those risk and control analysis. Now we mentioned uh, things like uh, the data analysis, the cost and effects, and things like that, the threat and modeling. We also mentioned gap analysis. Let me get into that. What is gap analysis? Please keep it shut. We are coming up on time. Anybody, what's gap analysis when it relates to how we spoke about it? The difference between what you have and what you need to have. Fair yeah, part, yep. Uh, the difference, <laughs> I like the way you just literally put it in a simple, yeah. So yeah, what do you have currently? Um, let's use controls, for example, what is the current state of controls and what do you need to add, right? That's a good one. Uh, prediction analysis, we also mentioned that. How do you actually make predictions? What did we touch up uh, in this class? Some few things to, how do you make predictions when it comes to risk management? Anyone? I'll give you one. Historical records. What happened before? That's one. I'm not starting to say like who is a fortune teller in this class now. <laughs> but yeah, how do you make predictions? Anybody? Any volunteer? Correlative? What are you correlating? I think it depends on uh, specialty. So like I can make predictions with. Uh, what people do on a given day with Splunk, right? Like whether machine learning, uh, human instinct, or AI. Okay. Like that's, that's predictable. So those are all based on data analysis, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you agree with that. Um, we also mentioned another. I think key performance indicators can, can help you out with the prediction. Keeping what? Key performance indicators, KPIs, can help you with prediction. KPIs. Okay, yeah, I'll take that, I guess, yeah. But in terms of KPIs, you will have to see it from what um, the result was in previous, re previous like um, occasions, right? To make a prediction by saying like, okay, if this is maintained at this level, then yeah. Okay, I will take that. Um, correct. Okay, next we have the risk analysis methodologies. What kind of methods did we talk about in this class? Well, not just in this class, pretty much. <laughs> what kind of methods? Qualitative and quantitative. All right, we added one in this class also. Semi-quantitative, right? A combination of both. Hardly do you come across it, but it happens. Um, risk ranking. How do we rank risk? What approach are we taking in this class or rather the NIST approach um, that we did? High, low and moderate. Okay, I will take that. That's what we do. But we also discuss appetite bands, remember? Doing it from an acceptable, unacceptable perspective, right? And then we also mentioned like Octave, which is completely focused on really risk ranking, right? Great. Then again, documenting, documenting, documenting. Everything must go into the risk register. Let's get into the risk assessment. And I know people are tired, but can't take a break, sorry. Not because we cannot, but I'm just looking at the time and uh, we have three more slides. Um, you know what, we can take five minutes. I'm just come back at 15. Is that okay with everybody? Sounds good. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Can everybody please go on mute? All right. Um, I think I'm still sharing my screen, right? Yep, I am. Okay. Um, IT risk response and mitigation. Not really a big fan of that mitigation word in there. I think I've always said this. 
So I just see the models and IT response because you can respond to, a, sorry, I always see the models and risk response because you can respond to a risk without mitigating it, right? If you accept a risk, you are not mitigating that risk. So I disagree with Isaka on this, but it is okay since they are considered an authority and I'm not. Actually, I'm an authority in my own space. In my head, I'm my own authority. So I, I disagree with Isaka. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, no, but depending on who you talk to or where you go, some see mitigation as a response itself. Even Isaka does. I just don't know why they did that, honestly. All right, um, again, just because you have identified a risk or you have identified the end of the world, it doesn't mean that you can just put a patch or fix it until you are certain that responding to it aligns with the business objectives, right? So if you um, are always responding to risk, do not respond to a risk based on, like do not respond based on the severity of the risk, but rather responds by factoring in how does it impact the business and aligning that response to the business objectives. Then you also figure out by using the severity as the ranking on how it impacts the business, right? Again, business, 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 objectives, business goals, business mission, they all come before anything within an organization. Risk response options, everybody should be okay with this. What's an example of an acceptance? Just one word, literally. What does it mean when you accept risk? Leave it as it is. Okay. Uh, when you accept risk, you're basically accepting that you have invested enough time, energy, resource, capital, security, et cetera, to mitigate a reasonable amount of risk to that asset, enough to at least negate the attack surface down to what the board, et cetera, has deemed to be acceptable or worth the investment and that no more um, time or money is going to be spent to reduce the attack surface any farther. You're accepting whatever risk is left after you've mitigated it as much as you have, that's the risk that there's gonna be. So, okay. I understand where you're coming from. I, I know exactly where that Delta falls around the effect, like what is already a control and what you have added and what classify as a risk kind of agree with you that what you are accepting risk, you are basically accept, agreeing that the existing control is sufficient. Agree with that. And uh, in a simpler terms, like you said, um, the first person is basically leaving it as it is because it's not going to impact you. I agree with all of everything you said. I will just not use the word mitigation in describing acceptance. But yeah, agree with you. Um, Waziri, this is Stephanie. Sometimes you can accept risk, you know, without putting any controls, right? Because yeah. sometimes like, like for the, in the government, for instance, if you only have a certain budget to kind of use for that year and you have a list of um, risk or something, then you say, okay, well, I have $10 million. These are the things that I'm going to fix. Mm -hmm. I can't afford to fix this thing, but you know, this system has to run. So we're going to just accept that that's a risk. You know so you are seeing it as you taking an action and i understand your school of thought as well like ignore the part of you making the decision there is a different school of thought that tend to see risk as if you identify that something is a risk whether you are taking an action or not there ex there has to be like there exists a, a control it is just not sufficient but no matter what it is there is a control okay i also understand your own school of thought like unless you are the one who made a decision on that control then there is not the the reason why the second part started coming into the picture is when it responding to risk from an it perspective started gaining traction because most it stuff like a lot of things 
there is you find risk in it is not necessarily the lack of control but rather the control is insufficient so when you say hardly do you come across a system that doesn't have a password mechanism right but then that password alone in itself is not enough so even though you're not the one who created that password mechanism you still have to acknowledge that there is an existing control so that is the other side of things. That's why I was saying like, I absolutely understand his explanation as well as where he's coming from. It's just, it depends on who you talk to, honestly. It's just one thing, I guess, that is not agreed. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, by the way, all of these kind of nuances are usually on the theoretical side of things. Honestly, when you go into the business, it's just, Am I spending dollars on it? No, then I'm accepting, that's it. But I understand both sides. Okay. Um, <clears throat> response analysis and techniques, right? We mentioned about um, the analysis first. I know it's at the bottom. Cost benefit analysis. It helps you understand if there is an ROI. Like, would you actually respond to a risk if there's no return on investment? Absolutely not. Should risk response be driven based on ROI alone? If ROI translates to your organization's objective, then absolutely yes. If ROI is just something else, but not the main objective of the organization, then maybe not. So that is just part of an analysis, right? Just like I believe, um, was it Stephanie from The Voice? Yeah, Stephanie mentioned like, you don't have a budget and whatsoever. So you do a cost benefit analysis and you decide not to respond to the risk. Is that the best method? Probably not because budget constraint might not necessarily be the reason why you should like you should not make a decision based on budget constraints if there is a huge impact to the organization right so unless you have maybe did an analysis and see like huh the effort to get this budget or where we're going to create this budget from and what we're taking the money away from does not justify it from an organizational objective perspective then i would agree with that right uh, when you flip to the other side of the coin, just because you have money laying around does not mean if you have a $200 laptop with no value whatsoever, you should go buy an antivirus of $10,000 just to protect the $200 laptop. It makes absolutely no sense unless the value of the device or the value of the content within the device or the value of everything relating to device outweighs the response if you're looking at it from a profitability perspective, right? So that's an example. Kind of hard, I'll be honest with you, to not make a response decisions based on the analysis, but it's only meant to be a technique, an analysis technique that influence the response, not necessarily um, decides. Factors, priority of risk, availability of control, the cause, all of those things are the different individual factors that can be um, considered to help you with the analysis. Okay. Always, when you are responding to a risk, especially from control implementation perspective, you should be mindful of what are you, what kind of risk are you also introducing by responding to the other one. Let me give you an example. Imagine an organization decides like, hey, you know what? It's very easy to clone key cards. So we are going to switch to, like it's very easy to clone key cards. Um, as such, we are going to replace all the key cards within um, the organizational entrance and switch it to biometrics. Now they put biometrics, but they didn't think of the vulnerabilities associated with the um, with biometrics. It's early in the morning, 8.30, you finish with Starbucks, walk into, come into work, and now you don't have to use your badge, you have to use your thumb. And, you know, that coffee, your hands are oily, it's been raining, whatsoever, the sensitivity is so much, and you find people just, it's taking like two minutes for you to be able, before you realize it, there is a long queue. That's a, <laughs> that's an issue right there, right? So, gotta, you always have to think of the risk, vulnerabilities, and other things that 
comes with new controls. Um, develop a risk action plan. What is a risk action plan? Similar to POA. Um, you will hear of how are you responding to the risk? Now that you've identified as part of the risk, but just an action plan, not necessarily responding per se, but you have to develop your action plan. In the government, we like calling it also a poem. That's the plan of action. A milestone is the new ones that separates it from uh, a risk register. It's, um, it documents like you have identified this risk and this is how you plan on address it, addressing it, right? So it contains like the strategy and the time frame to address the risk. The strategy involves the resources, the budget, the oversight, all of those things. How many people do you need? How many hours? How many FTEs? All of those things need to go into the picture, right? Um, business process review, the tools, techniques, we have discussed this, evaluate current business process, identify the potential changes. We have spoke about all of these. Now we're getting to that point of the book where it's you now basically sounding redundant. Um, control design and implementation. We spoke about those uh, managerial, technical, and physical. We literally just finished the categories of controls. Um, control monitoring and effectiveness. We spoke about same tools, like Splunk is one of them. So really gaining traction, but also the event, uh, wait, there is something like event logs, I believe, or what is it in Windows system? Or is it event viewer? It's also a control monitoring and effectiveness method, but you just have to be the one to really go fish that out, unlike the intelligent ones like Splunk or whatsoever. Different types of risk, inherent residual, and um, current, earlier Novaris was, was it Novaris or someone was mentioning them? But yeah, we touched upon this. Control activities, practices, and metrics. I will focus more on the third party management around managed service providers, right? We discuss what a managed service provider is, where they are providers that kind of put together um, they put together tools or processes or practices or certain activities that needs to be done. They put it together and sell it as a single service, right? So let me give you an example. I know um, most consulting firms they do that because there is the need to continuously monitor controls and it's a tasking stuff. You find like a lot of these consulting firms, they will now have a lot of license from like Splunk, they will identify like two of their personnel, they will identify the, they will flesh out the entire process, they will put it together and say like, hey, if you give us a contract to be the ones doing your continuous uh, control monitoring, we will be able to do it for a single price of this. And these are the tools we use. We use Splunk as a tool, we'll give you two steps, we'll do all of those kind of things. That's our managed service providers, right? And then we'll also have like the cloud service providers, like say, Aja might say like, hey, here's all of this as a single license. And you just consume it. Um, change control, we mentioned about that in like organizations, how anything that comes around decision relating to the controls, should be done based on we have something called CCB, but it should be a collective decision. That is a very good place where bottom up method as well as the top down should all come together and have equal voice because management can never ever see things at the execution uh, from an execution lens of how a system admin is doing this. So it's always good to hear what the doers also go through and what they identify as risk. Even if you disagree with it, it's always good to hear it, right? Okay. Um, next control design and implementation. We mentioned this testing, change over, which is go live. And we also spoke about migrations, how if you should have phased migrations, if you have abrupt migration or phased migrations, which is you are moving from one service to another, should you just move instantly? Should you move in parts or should you basically maintain both and kind of test it out and build your confidence level before migrating, right? In impact of emerging technologies on controls. Um, <laughs> we always have this. <clears throat> 
if you don't know what stick is, you can ignore this example. But there's this joke around like, you're always one update away from breaking your sticks, right? So you finish sticking a system, especially Windows is terrible with that. And I know the irony, I work with Microsoft, but yeah, um, you finish implementing your sticks and everything and the update will come in and before you realize it, it has broken certain sticks. But then also if you are to implement stick at 100%, then the computer is not usable or rather the system is not usable, right? Um, but yeah, we mentioned emerging technologies earlier. You consume them and know what those emerging technologies are from, from news and information perspective. Sometimes joining all of these groups, associations, you're always up to date on what the emerging trends, sorry, the emerging technologies are. But then you also have to evaluate them on how do they impact your existing controls. A good example is around cryptography, right? Um, if crypt, like cryptography, the faster computers are getting higher processors, the more you are able to break all of these encryption algorithms, right? So the more you are following it, the more you are knowing if your yeah, encryption algorithm, which are controls are still applicable. Control ownership, like risk, as we mentioned, controls must also be owned. Okay. Oh, I still, have, I still have the same title here. It's a mistake, but yeah. Risk control, um, control, sorry. Risk and control monitoring and reporting. Now that you have responded to the risk, do you just ignore it? No, you have to continuously monitor the control that allows, that you implemented when responding to the risk. Assuming you implemented controls, right? One, you establish your KRIs, we mentioned them from a selection, effectiveness, okay, optimization and all of those angles. You also identify your KPIs and define them well. And you look at them from different angles of customer satisfaction. An example is, please, 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 in this class, everybody should go and submit an evaluation. Please write some feedback in there around how we can improve this class. I am more focused on what the improvement points are than the kudos, but that's a key performance indicator. If say, the school want to evaluate me, my performance, right? They look at the student satisfaction and student's response from the evaluation and say, okay, this is where he is. Um, data collection and extraction techniques, these are, we mentioned this from internal data sources, external data, please don't go to the dark web. Hey, you can, if it's legal, what you're doing, it's a data source. So um, monitoring controls, different methods from self-assessment, automated assessment, third party could involve internal or external. There are different steps of monitoring. We don't need to go through them, but we mentioned them, right? And eventually the goal is to always have some form of reported where you're able to monitor progress, know the full status of your controls because knowing the status of the controls allows you to know the overall status of your risk. The current posture of your risk basically. Assessment types, we mentioned it and we also even gave an example from CMM perspective. Changes to the IT risk profile we basically touch on that. Now I'm gonna go high level into the ATO process. Okay, by the way, with this, we are done with the ISACA part of the class. That's it. High level on the next um, process of what we touched upon in the class, we spoke about pretty much the entire RMF steps, which is covered in the 800-37, the first step around prepare preparations. Then you categorize the system. Once you categorize the system, you have to, like you use the 800-60 document and the fit for 99 to categorize the system, right? That's assuming you are looking at it from the civilian side. If you're looking at it from the intelligence community or the DOD side of things from national security, you use CNSSI 1253, but it is not what we did in this class. So yours is, will be focused on 800-60 and 599. Second, you have to implement 
sorry, select your controls. Where do you get the controls from? 800-53, lay out all of the controls. We use ref4 in this class, but we already have now ref5, it's out. And you refer to FIPS 200 to kind of understand how to use the 800-53. The third step around implementing the controls, how do you do that? Well, it depends on the technology that you're implementing the control on. And there are a lot of guidance from the providers, vendors, and whatsoever on how to implement controls. Also, NIST have some generic documentations, especially the dash 34 and the dash 61, right? These are just examples. After you implement, you then have to assess. Once you assess your system, what do you use? You use the 800-53A as a guidance, but it doesn't tell you the technological assessment procedure, right? But rather it tells you what to look for based on what you implement. Once you assess the system, you create, um, the assessor creates a SAR, opens the POEM and all of those agreements and then give a recommendation to the authorized official, the AO, to what? Authorize. How do you authorize the guideline is outlined because it's not a heavy lift. It's outlined in the 800-53 on how an authorized official should authorize a system. Next, we get into that monitoring. Dash 37 has some uh, monitoring procedures, high level. 800-53 uh, also like presents some monitoring um, things to kind of identify, especially around logs and whatsoever. But the main document is the 800-137, right? Which presents you with that continuous monitoring process. It doesn't tell you how to monitor, like, oh, go use SIEM tools or even use Plunk, no. But rather it tells you the key things you should pay attention to when you get to the monitoring phase. And that's it, right? Um, so same information, all of those, like the, from the step zero to six that we touch upon and the tools that you're going to use, or rather that are commonly used, there are other things. But in this class, we have these deliverables. The FIPS and Lieutenant document, you are also scoping your controls around those uh, spreadsheets from the 800-53. You will write the implementation statement in them. There is the implementation screenshot, there is the effectiveness video, the POEM, the ISCP, and then a collection of the package, right? Which is all of the deliverables plus the SSP and ATO memo, right? Without the video evidence. And then some guidelines is we agreed that you should encrypt the ATO package in a folder and upload it to Canvas without the key. And then you save the encryption key in a .txt format without a space, email key using your Gmail. I guess it should say Marimon Gmail, right? Not your personal place, but Marimon Gmail using the format we outlined and there should be no message in the body. And that's it, everybody. Literally, that's it. I know I didn't give anybody a chance to say anything, but please in the next, um, let me take five minutes to add some few things and we have, uh, I'm sorry, I, like there is a presentation in the class, hold on a second, that is meant to happen. Please give me a second, let me pull the information related to the presentation in the class. John? Um, yes. Just a second. John will be presenting um, a good qualitative analysis of uh, cyber security investment in a great overview and kind of agreed that it's going to take 30 minutes. Um, Dr. Wateri, I can not understand what you're saying. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay. So John will be presenting um, uh, some good uh, kind of findings he has around a discussion on quantitative analysis of cybersecurity investments on how that kind of um, reduces risk. Really looking forward to it. I saw the slides quite um, 
entertaining, but looking forward to hearing more. We agreed that he's going to take 30 minutes, but please uh, keep in mind, like you don't have to be here. It would be really great for you to kind of hang around if you have the time to listen to that, but I'm absolutely not making everyone um, listen to it. Uh, it's not a must, nor does it uh, relate to basically this class as a requirement. But it would be great if you have the bandwidth to just listen to that. I will let you know when we start that. It's going to start at 9 p.m. And we're just going to take 30 minutes for it to end by 9.30. So between now and then, I'm just going to cover some high level things, very high level around the overall class expectations, because this is our last class and things like that. And um, pretty much that's it. And listen to other people who have questions. I'm looking forward to answering that. So <clears throat> this is the end of the class, no jokes. I usually quickly jump to, I think I have this class. Where is it? Uh, it's not like we have already answered all of this. Sorry, I'm kind of going fast. Oh, where is it? Oh, OK, great. Um, yeah, Dave, I didn't like you, so I didn't put how to get in touch with you. But um, please, at any point in time, at any point, even if um, the class ends, if you want just the material related to the class and things like that, I tend to push them, free, make them just out there um, on GitHub. So feel free to check or just email me or something like that. You should be able to get the deck and some few contents around the class. Please keep in touch. Um, for summer, I have not finalized yet. Also, I'm not doing the 747, but I see that they have added 737 for me to take as well as 727, which is this class. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm yet to make a decision. And I don't know why it says summer 2020, it should say spring 2021. So I guess I did not update this slide. I should have, but yeah. Um, Feel free towards December to uh, ask me or kind of check online if you're interested in taking uh, another class. As you know, I didn't piss you off already. Um, <laughs> um, I honestly have not finalized um, which class I'm going to teach for spring. 